All right. So thanks, everybody, for coming. Um, first, before I get started, I have a short story. Um, many moons ago, when I was taking chemistry in university, I had a professor, and it was an 8 a.m. course. <clears throat> and I wasn't a chemistry major, so I wasn't particularly interested in waking up at 8 a.m. And for some reason, he would give muffins out for people who answered questions. And that somehow, coincidentally, made the lectures a little more interesting. So I figure after lunch, maybe muffins aren't the best approach, but I'm the guy carrying notebooks around because I like to use pencil and paper at a computer conference. Kind of makes no sense. But two questions to think about while the talk is going on. Um, one, how many ways can we launch the same code by the end of the talk? Um, if you get it right or get close, you can have a notebook. Two, um, what's another way that I didn't mention that we could launch the same code? So two things to keep in mind as we get going. Um, as you can see here, the title of the talk is Script, Library, or Executable. You don't have to choose. You can have it all. <clears throat> so my name is Luke Lee. Um, here's my Twitter handle. That's the best way to get in touch with me. I primarily do GUI and CLI applications in Python for oil and gas. Um, but you're not probably super interested in me. You want to hear about what I'm here to talk about. If you'll notice this link down, maybe it's not any bigger. This link down here will have all the references to the the code and all the stuff that I talk about and everything if you want to find out more. So the goal of this talk is to show one way to expand a CLI script to support a CLI interface, a library, a GUI, and an executable, all with the same type of code. Um, I just want to stress that it's only one way because there's a ton of different ways to do this, and this is just a way that has worked for me in the past and I've had success with. So first off, let's start with a simple CLI example. What we're gonna do here is we're gonna walk through building um, the WC Unix clone. If you aren't familiar, WC is a simple Unix utility that counts lines and words in a file. Um, the code isn't particularly interesting here. It's just gonna use it to build as an example. So here is if you know your coworker comes and says to you, oh, I really wish I had WC on Windows. Um, here's what you might end up whipping up if you're using Python 3. Um, Again, the code isn't super interesting. All it does is open a file, take the first argument, count the lines and words, and print them out. So there's a couple of things that are missing from here. And again, for this one simple one-off case, this is probably just, just fine. But if we note there's no help, um, the code isn't very extensible. The reason for that is that the argument parsing and the real work are kind of mingled together. Not super like problematic in code that's this small, but it could be a problem later. Um, that also makes it more difficult for other developers to reuse that code later. And then the uh, the other caveat is that it requires Python. So if you have a user that is maybe on Windows or something and they just want to use this, you might have to have that weird conversation where you talk to them about Python 2 versus Python 3. Uh, always a bit uncomfortable. So the first principle of being able to support all these interfaces is the separation of concerns. What this means is, I mentioned before, that the argument parsing and reading of the file were mixed together. So that makes it a little harder to work with. So in this case, we want to separate the concerns of dealing with the CLI interface and then the processing of the file. Um, you'll hear the separation some concerns idea preached a lot with GUIs. It's probably more useful and talked about there because you might have a widget over here and then you have a model over here. And if you have those two things mingled together, then you can't switch out this widget or switch out this model. You have everything stuck together. When dealing with the CLI like we're doing here, we can just think about sys.argv as our user interface. And in this case, counting lines and words is our action. So again, it's useful to separate that. So what would that look like? Um, also, we're still using this very small little bit of code um, and I've trimmed it just so that we can fit it on a screen. So maybe one way we would do this is to separate those two things out with like a CLI function that will handle all of our argument parsing. And then this git file info, which is basically the, almost all the same code that we had before. The difference is it's gonna take an argument called file, so it's not gonna deal with sys.argv anymore, and it's gonna return some data, so it's not gonna print it. And then we have the uh, standard Python idiom of dunder name equals dunder main here, and that's just gonna be the glue that ties things together. Parse the CLI, and then call the function and print that out. The the other interesting thing here is that we're doing the printing in the Dunder main portion. All that does is keep us from printing when we're importing. So that way we're going to only print now when we're run as a script. And then real quickly, the git file info, I refactored it just a little bit so that it returns a name tuple. So the API is just a little cleaner. It's easier to see. 
But again, nothing super different here. <clears throat> so what does the CLI function look like? Um, if you've ever used arg parse, which is built into the standard library, there's not going to be anything very exciting here. A couple of reasons I'm using arg parse is, like I said, it's built into the standard library, and it will provide us with automatic help. And the other thing is it's kind of boring, which is, could be really nice. Um, if I give this to most any Python developer, they're not going to freak out and spend all their time trying to figure out how the argument parsing works, because more than likely that's not the most interesting part of your application. So every now and then it's okay to pick boring technologies. Um, that being said, there are some really nice CLI frameworks in Python. One I really like a lot is Click. CLI frameworks are kind of like uh, static site generators. Once you start to learn a little bit of code, you write your own. So there's no shortage of choices out there. But in this case, we're going to stick with ArcParse for other reasons that we'll find out later. Um, again, the code not particularly interesting, except for this args equals vars line. Um, ArcParse does this really annoying thing, to me at least, that when you parse the arguments, it returns a namespace object, which works pretty much like a named tuple. But then if you pass that data around everywhere, everyone knows you used ArcParse because you're passing around an ArcParse name tuple which I find really annoying. I don't want to call a library function and it know I had an argparse type in there. So this vars, arg, uh, vars function just turns that into a standard dictionary so I can talk dictionaries to everyone and no one has to know that I ever used argparse at all. Not because I'm ashamed of it, but that's just because I don't want to leak that implement, implementation detail out. Okay, so that takes care of a CLI interface. Um, now what happens if we have a coworker that comes by and says, hey, you know that uh, WC thing you wrote would be really neat. I want it in my code, and they happen to be doing Python work. You're like, okay, well, you could copy the CLI file around, or I could refactor it into a package so that you could use it in your code. So the way we would do that is we have to expand our directory structure a little bit. Um, first, we're going to have to have a setup.py, and then I'm going to call the tool pywc because I'm not that creative, and it's pywc. And we'll have an api.py function. That function, or that file, you can name anything you want. I just used API here. And we're going to put most of the code and all the real work goes in this API function. And then we have these other two strangely named files. So if you've been around Python for a long time, this won't look weird to you. But if you haven't been around Python for a while, this will look very, very weird to you. Um, the first one is the dunder init.py. That just tells Python that this is going to be a package. Coincidentally, that's not required in Python 3 anymore, only if you're making a namespace package, but that's a conversation for a whole different talk. But in Python 2, this will be required, and it's still recommended, so we're going to do that. And then we have this dunder main.py, which we'll get into a little later. As you can think of, it has a strange name, but since it has this double underscore, that should be your clue that it probably is something built in. So what does a setup.py look like? Um, there's a million different ways to do a setup.py. That, again, is another thing. That's a whole other talk or tutorial all on its own. The setup function takes tons of arguments. There's a ton of different ways to do it. So I'm just going to not show any of those things and show the very simple thing, um, a name, a version, and then something that I find kind of useful when you want to list packages. In our specific example, it's not super useful, but a lot of times people will list out all their packages as strings, and then if you add a sub package and you forget to add it to your setup.py, and you push it to PyPI or something, and then you're not getting all the files. So one thing I always do is use this find packages function. And what that does is it goes recursively into the directory you're in, finds all the Python packages, and will make sure they're included in your distribution. Other than that, tons of options, but we're going to skip over that. So kind of the main star of the talk is this dunder main.py file. So what the heck is that? Um, looking at the code, not anything that we haven't really seen before. Um, we're going to import from our API to get that git file info function. We're going to have our CLI function that's going to be exactly like it was before. And then we're going to have a main function instead of putting all the code in the dunder name equals dunder main. The main reason for this is if we ever import from dunder main.py, I don't want all this name pollution. So if someone runs dir on our module, we don't want them to see the args variable and the file info variable and all these other things. So what I'll do is I'll package that into a main function so that those names don't leak later and make our API kind of ugly. And then, again, it's not that, not that different. We're just going to call that. So that's kind of how our library works. But then you might be thinking, okay, well, we kind of lost the CLI interface because now everything is locked away inside of a package. How do we run a package? 
Well, setup.py has one way for us to do that, the entry points argument. So let's revisit setup.py and add a little bit of code. The only di thing different here is this entry points line. And all that's doing is has some kind of fancy dictionary that you pass it. Um, and it has to be called console scripts. And then this next line that has some really weird syntax. But what it says is install a console script called pywc. And when someone calls that, I want you to call pywc package, the dunder main module, and the CLI function. So it looks kind of fancy, but that's all it means. Um, and what this is going to do is when you pip install the package now, you're going to get a pywc executable or script probably on your path or in your virtual environment or somewhere. So that sort of takes care of the CLI interface, right? So now the library developers that wanted our code, they can pip install it and they magically get this pywc script. But maybe our original CLI user is going to be a little annoyed because maybe they have no idea what the heck pip is. Maybe they're not really a Python developer, they just happen to have Python installed. So telling them to say, oh, well, install pip, now pip install, and now use this is just like, no, not going to happen, right? So how can we support them as well as the library developers? The trick to that is Python has this built-in argument called dash m. And this is a standard Python interpreter argument. What this really means is run this module as a script. So the, that's the trick with our dunder main.py. So what um, dash m does is it looks for dunder main.py or a dunder init equals dunder main for the name of the package and runs it like a script. So you can think of this dunder main.py file as kind of the package equivalent of the dunder init equals dunder main idiom that you see in regular scripts. Um, and just to show you that this is something that I invented and I'm not completely lying to you, it's used all over the standard library. So here's a list of all the different things you can use. Not all of these are using a dunder main.py file. Some of them are using just dunder init equals dunder main. But there's all sorts of really cool stuff in here. I'd encourage you to like check all these out. Run python dash m with all these names in the dash h and see what they do. Um, some cool ones I think are around is sysconfig. If you're ever really interested in how your Python binary was compiled and what kind of options it used, do python dash m sysconfig. It will tell you all that information. Um, another trick if you're a web developer is json.tool. Python dash m json.tool, give it some unformatted ugly JSON, you'll get nicely formatted indented JSON out on standard out. Um, zip file, tar file, you can do all of these things just by installing Python. You can get a calendar, pop up a web browser, base64 and code stuff, um, all sorts of stuff with this dash m. If you've never seen it before, it's really cool. So now our package is going to behave the exact same way. So, if you're keeping track now, we have two ways to run this package. We have python dash m, pywc, and I'm adding the dash h here because we get that for free with arc parse. And then you can also use the pywc dash h that was installed with the entry points for setup tools. Okay, so that takes care of the CLI interface and the library user. So now we can tell our original CLI user oh, we'll just copy this pyc directory instead of this pyc.py file, run python dash m instead of python. So it's not as dramatic of a change for that user. And then the library developers are happy because they can pip install it just like it's regular PyPI stuff. And in fact, you could put it on PyPI if you want. The next part comes in when maybe you have a user or someone that's heard about this cool application in another department and they have no idea what Python is and they're not going to like be like most of us and just sit here and look at a black screen with white letters all day. They're not going to want a console or a CLI approach. They want a GUI approach. Um, so it might look like I have a huge typo that I should have checked way before if I'm going to be talking about GUI on the screen right now. Um, I assure you that it's not the case because what I'm going to do is use a project called GUI, G-O-O-E-Y, to build a, ju a GUI, G-U-I. It's out, that's, that's actually more confusing than explaining to you just how it works. So typically with the GUI project, just go with me with the names here, um, how that's going to work is you have basically only two line change. We import, and then we use the decorator. The trick is you have to put the decorator on the function that handles arg parse. Now remember I said that we were using arg parse for a number of reasons. This is exactly one of those reasons. GUI works with arg parse. And what it does is like super clever. Um, it's kind of like you look around at the code, and it's like one of those things, I don't know if you've ever dealt with it, where you look at the code and you're like, man, I wish I would have wrote that. 
really cool. Um, what it does is it acts as a decorator and it replaces the parse args function of the arg parse library with its own code and that makes it call back into itself. And then it looks at all the actions that you add in arg parse. So for example, in this one case, I have add argument action store. So it looks at all these actions on your arg parse object and maps them to an equivalent GUI type that would be useful for that. So if you had store true as the action, it's going to say, okay, that's probably a Boolean. I'm going to give you a checkbox. In this case, store might mean that you're going to get a text box. It does all of this stuff behind the scenes and you don't have to do anything. So you can get an automatic GUI with basically two lines of code. Um, another thing to note is it uses WX widgets, which some people may say is great, some people may hate, but if you're just building a little CLI script, getting, like getting a GUI for free is pretty sweet. So here's what it would look like if I used it with absolutely no customization at all. Luckily, there's tons of customization. I'm just too lazy and I'm not a graphic artist, so this is what you get. Um, again, so it's mapping, you know, the count words and count lines. It saw those as Booleans, the store, Excel that as a text box, and you get a start button. So if you want to use GUI and you only want a GUI interface, that would be all you need to do. But the whole point of this talk is to support all of these launching mechanisms at the same time. So we want to support dash dash GUI. So we want to opt in. And so to do that, we have to kind of jump through a little bit of a hoop. We can't just use the at GUI decorator because that will turn our script into a GUI only application. So again, the separation of concerns idea, like let the CLI do its thing, let the GUI do its thing, we'll keep them separate, and only reuse the stuff that makes sense. So we'll add a allow GUI option equals true here. The only reason that even exists is we don't want, since GUI introspects your arg parse, we don't want an option in the GUI itself to say show the GUI. Kind of doesn't make any sense. Um, so that's going to hide that. And then since we don't want to use the decorator approach because we want to use an option to do it, we'll make a GUI function. And then we kind of have to simulate the way a decorator works, which is a function that takes a function. So we create a small function, bind that argument to say don't show the GUI when I call you, and then call a GUI as if it was used as a decorator but without the fancy at syntax. So then we basically have a GUI. Um, then you might think, man, I really wish I could install that GUI. Well, luckily, Setup Tools has a way to do this. So the corollary to console scripts is GUI scripts. Works basically the same way. The only thing that's going to be different is this GUI scripts is going to tell pip to install it as a windowed script. And what that really means is a fancy way for saying don't pop up a console window. So again, we're trying, we build the GUI to keep people away from having to sit here at a console. So if we launch a GUI and then we launch a black and white window that spams a whole bunch of text, it's probably going to freak a lot of people out. So we're going to hide that by using this GUI scripts, and we're going to call it pywcg. And again, same story, call the pywc package, the Dunder main module, and then the GUI function. So for all those keeping track, two more ways, dash m pywc dash dash GUI or pywcg. So remember pywcg was pip installed now with the console scripts. And next. So we have CLI users happy, we have the library users happy, we have the GUI users happy, but then maybe we have another set of users that has no idea what Python is, or in the worst case, maybe you have a manager that says, oh, you really should not use Python. You're like, mm, I can use what I want, you just won't know. So the way to do that, we pi installer. Um, what pi installer does is, it's kind of hard to describe as anything other than just pure magic. Um, and I'm going on, like, this is just a bet here, but the guy that wrote Pine Solar, I know, I owe him many, many beers, and he's from Germany, so is any chance he's in the room? One day the answer to that is going to be yes. One day. Um, anyway, so all that aside, Pine Solar, you give it a script, and it performs a whole bunch of magic on that script to find out what your dependencies are, package them all up into an executable or a directory that you want, and you ship it to a user, and they have absolutely no idea where it came from, unless they want to dig around in the directories and they see stuff called, like, python27.so or dll or something. Um, but again, I seriously doubt this sect of users is going to be doing that. So the other cool thing that PyInstaller does is it supports all sorts of common stuff that people use, like PyQt, NumPy, WX, which is useful for us because we're using the GUI project, you can also make executables for Windows, Linux, and Mac OS. The only downside of that is you can't cross-compile. 
So if you want to make a Windows executable, you have to do it from a Windows machine and vice versa. And again, the huge benefit of this is no one has to know that we used Python. So that manager that said you can't use Python, maybe they won't care if they get an application that works exactly the way they want it to, and they have no idea. If they get a button to double click, everybody is good. So how do we expand to support PyInstaller? Um, in general, we wouldn't really have to do much of anything other, other than like maybe rename some stuff. So the way we're going to do that is PyInstaller takes a script, and it only creates one executable from that script. So we can't really pass arguments to that script to turn on the GUI and, that, and vice versa. And I think it's a little cleaner if you just separate things out. Again, the separation of concerns idea goes deep. Um, so we have our setup.py. Nothing's going to be changed there. Now we'll create a CLI.py that's going to be out of our package and a GUI.py that's also out of our package. The reason for this is then we can tell PineStar to create a CLI from the CLI.py and a GUI from the GUI.py. Um, and then all this code can be shared under um, inside of dundermain.py. So we're trying to reuse as much stuff as possible. So what does CLI.py look like? Super boring, super good. Um, so import the CLI function and call it. What do you think the GUI function looks like? Exactly the same. Change like a few letters. Awesome. And how do you use PyInstaller? Um, pretty simple. Pip install PyInstaller. PyInstaller CLI dash dash name PYC. So what this does is PyInstaller looks at the CLI.py, finds out all of our dependencies, which in this case isn't going to be much. Um, but in the case that you're using NumPy and all sorts of other stuff, this is like huge. Like the fact that this works is just insane. And then the dash name argument to say we want to create an executable, we want it to be called PYWC. Um, that will be PYWC.exe on Windows, and it'll just be a regular executable on Linux. And on Mac, it will be um, inside of a dist folder. And you can there's different options for all of these things for different OSs. So that would create the CLI.exe that we can run. Now we want to make the GUI executable. And that works almost the same way with two small caveats. Um, we're going to name it something different. And then there's this dash W argument. That's kind of the equivalent of what we did when we said in the setup.py use GUI scripts. Remember I said that would make it launch, not launch the console window. Well, this dash W does the same thing in PyInstaller language. So it says, don't, you know, create a windowed application so that we have our own GUI, we can do our own logging wherever we want, don't pop up this console window. And the second caveat is, unfortunately, um, misfortune for me is that this line still doesn't quite work if you run it as it is. There's a pull request waiting in PyInstaller to package up the GUI project. It has some language files and some uh, other stuff that don't quite get packaged right by PyInstaller. But luckily you can change that if you add a dash dash additional hooks directory and you give it one file. If you look at the references based on what uh, the link I have here, I'll show you exactly how to do it. It's like one file. Or, I mean, I haven't checked today, who knows. Maybe he, he's not here because he uh, you know merged that pull request and it works. Even better. Okay. So now we've got the CLI, we've got a library, we've got a GUI, and then we package everything up so no one has to know we're using Python. I feel like that's kind of weird to say at a Python conference that you want to hide that you're using Python, but whatever. Um, so the takeaways. This idea of separation of concerns. So the idea that we want to take our interface and separate it from our real work. So in this case, it was pretty trivial to do that, but that in a bigger project, you can see how that would give you a whole bunch of opportunities to be able to reuse the code. So if you notice, we support all these different entry points and ways to launch our application with almost no additional code. We're basically just reusing the same one, remix and repeat. Um, so the separation of concerns idea is really, really useful. Whether you're trying to make a GUI or a CLI or whatever, that's a still good, a good practice. How do we do that? Entry points, um, that's the first way we can support a library and executables at the same time. So you pip install, and in the setup.py we had these entry points, console scripts and GUI scripts to be able to do both, so that we can install both. Next, what I always think of as kind of the star of the talk is the dundermain.py. Um, it adds support for the dash m argument to Python. In this case, it served as kind of our single file entry point. We shared most of the code in dundermain and just kind of imported it in other places. 
the other cool thing is it's a commonly used pattern, like I showed you. The Python standard library does it all the time. And I'd encourage you when you install a package, just run it with dash m and see what happens. Sometimes you'll be super surprised. GUI, again, looks like a typo, but this is going to make a GUI for us using WX widgets, typically with two lines of code. In our case, it was a little bit more. Py installer, um, just pure magic. Uh, when you, when you uh, do the Py installer line, you're going to see it spit so much stuff on your screen. And it's like oddly gratifying to just see like it's doing so much work for you. And then you can like run it with the log debug and look at all the stuff it's doing. It's just, it's amazing. I can't get over it. Okay. So um, that brings us pretty close to the end. And I don't have beer and donuts, but there's not really a notebook emoji. So I'm going to talk to Apple about that. Does anybody have a count for how many ways you can launch it? A guess. How many? Four? Five? Three. Uh, it's not prices right. Eight? Close. So this is the ways that I can think of. I think the count is ten. Um, okay. So so ten. Um, but that was just like an elaborate troll because there's these three other ways to do it too. Uh, <laughs> Um, these kind of work, they, they kind of don't make any sense, so you can run the GUI executable with a dash dash GUI argument. So if anybody had 13, well done. Um, these kind of work as a, a quirk of the way the GUI introspection works, um, that's kind of like a take-home homework if you want to figure out how that works. Does anybody have a way that we could have launched it that I didn't mention? As what? As a service? Okay. Anybody else? As a microservice. Oh. Ah, all right, more buzzwords, more buzzwords. What else we got? What else we got? <laughs> um, so one I didn't mention, but I kind of scrolled past is in the dash M, there's a project called or a package called Zip App. And what Zip App does is built into the standard library and it does almost exactly this. It will zip up a directory and it will just run your Python dundermain.py and you can ship it that way too. So that's kind of cool. Again, like always use the dash M and like dash H and see what's in there. Okay. Um, anybody, any other ways you can think to launch it? How about a Docker extension? I'm just trying to think of weird, uh, all right. Um, that's all I have. I think we may have time for like two questions. So there's my contact info. The uh, link will point you to uh, GitHub gist. And if you want to comment on the talk or say anything, point out different ways to do it. Or if you have ideas and you have horror stories of something, dealing with supporting all these interfaces. Um, I'd love to have a beer and like rant and rave about it. Or if you have other ideas of ways to do it, I'd love to hear that too. So any questions? Correct. So the question is, now that we depend on the GUI project, do we put that in the setup.py? Yeah, I didn't show it here, but I would add that as the install requires argument. And then you would also typically have like a requirements.txt or something. But the way I've written it, and if you check out the real code, you could see that the way I've written it, the CLI doesn't depend on the GUI. So if someone pip installs it, it doesn't matter. It won't complain unless they try to use the dash dash GUI argument. Uh, I don't. It's it's possible there's something like that. Um, oh, yeah, so the question is, do I know of anything that's like a GUI for click? It, there might be. Um, I think the reason that GUI, one of the reasons I think GUI works is, like I mentioned, argparse has been in the standard library for a long time, and it's really boring and really easy to program against, whereas click moves really fast. So I think if you made something like this, you might just end up like chasing your tail a lot because of the way click moves, but... It's possible there could be something out there like that. That would be really cool, too. Um, there's no namespace arguments in clicks, so I'm all bo on board. Um, any other questions? Uh, related to the last question, the project is called Quick and is only available on GitHub. Just search for GUI and Click, and you will find a link to it. Okay, great. And so I there. Okay. Okay. Awesome. So the answer to the previous question is there is a way to do it with click. It's called quick. How do you spell that? Q-U-Y-C-K. Okay. 
Q-U-I-C-K. So, okay, exactly like you would say quick. Um, <laughs> I got G-U-I and G-O-O-E-Y, so who knows? Um, that could have, yeah, okay, anyway, quick. That could be another way that it would work. And it sounds like it works somehow. Awesome. So that works. Great. Any other questions? So the question is, can you do subcommands, like the way the uh, the git CLI works, like you do git space add or git space commit or, you know, something like that. Um, arg parse does support that. They, I think it's called argument groups. And so you can have argument groups and do that. And I think click does it too based on how, where you put the decorator or you, there's an argument to say which group it's in. So there's definitely a way to do that, yeah. All right. Thanks everybody for coming. Um, if you had an answer or you just want a notebook, they're up here. <laughs>